think maybe it had something to do with the Velvet Underground too, didn't it? Because it's such a popular band. Oh, yeah, well, I never listened to those, so I don't know. Because <laughs> that was one of Pablo's favorite bands. Yeah, they were. They were. And some genius came up with this idea of a cardboard wall. Where in the world would you get all that cardboard? <laughs> Where? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that's what I said. I mean, we would ask, uh, we would announce it because the students would uh, roam around the whole city with uh, posters and uh, slogans and signs. So we would send everybody who, who could go uh, everywhere and they would talk to people and they said, okay, tomorrow, bring the cardboards. Anyone who has a cardboard, bring them to the communist headquarters. And the almost is the size of Cedar Rapids, 120,000 people. There is a lot of cardboards around, even in those communist times. I mean, we didn't have some, some, there was lacking of some things, but cardboards were always the Lord. We had cardboards. <laughs> Was there some participation as it went along from the labor unions? Uh, I think that at that time uh, the labor unions were very much, uh, they were communist labor unions. So uh, they were cautious, like especially the working class. I mean, when, when, when we were showing the picture of, the, of uh, the general strike, and I remember how especially workers uh, how it was difficult to get us, uh, get them on the side of the striking students because there is a rift between the blue collar and the, and the white collar la layer of the society, at, at, at especially the socialist countries. I mean, they were always the intellectuals, which the students would represent, uh, were always a little bit suspicious. The communism and socialism was based on the farmers and the workers. The intelligentsia, as they called it, was always a little bit kind of shaky. They did too much of a thinking, you know, and then you're not supposed to think, being living in a socialist country. You're supposed to work. I mean, you read Orwell 1994, maybe, or The Animal Farm, the same thing. Uh, so uh, there was a rift which we needed to bridge. That was one thing, and the other reason was 1968. Uh, when we were traveling around the country and trying to persuade people to join, join us and join the general strike, uh, we were meeting over and over with this older generation, this despair. I remember how uh, we went to the uh, uh, labor unions in one of the factories. This is at the time where I was arrested. It was a kind of arm-making factory. It was silly of us to go because they thought that we were going to get guns or something to come. So that's why they arrested us as well. But they looked at us and they said, whatever you do, you won't make it anyway. They did it to us. I mean, we were hopeful in 1968 but they send the tanks and they will do it again. So there's no point. And we could see how the older generation was really uh, despairing and how they were uh, passive because they did not have the hope and didn't have the trust because they lived through those times. It probably needed the students who did not remember 1968 and this uh, big failure of the hopes of the Prague Spring. So the trade unions, I think that they were very much on the side of, uh, even if they were sympathetic with us, they would be the older generation who would think, oh, we won't make it again, which is too small and the odds are against us. You had to be too optimistic and too, I don't know, foolish to believe that it could be pulled out. How did Havel rise to the top then? That was strange. I mean, that, that, that was just, that, that was a time when the masses had so much power and that, that, that was the atmosphere. I don't know, I mean, some of the things are unexplainable. He himself says, I don't know. I mean, there were many options. Dubček would have been the president. There were other people, but Havel somehow, because he was in jail, he was very much always standing up for his views and opinions. He was the one uh, who became the moral authority because of his, of his background. Thank you. Okay. Well, fast forwarding to now, uh, given that your country was invaded by Nazi Germany and occupied by Soviet Russia. What is it, the, when I was in the Czech Republic, it was very obvious as part of the European Union. What do the Czechs feel about, given their history, being part of a greater Europe? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I think they're still pretty much divided. Uh, if, uh, if, you, uh, if you think about, uh, you, you're asking about now. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people, uh, especially, about, I, it, it's, it's hard to say really, because you have the Czech president now who was replaced, Václav Havel, it's like Václav, another Václav, it's Václav Klaus, he's 
uh, rather skeptical about Europe. He was uh, Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic was the last repo uh, last country that signed the Lisbon Treaty, which you know, reforms European Union. And there is still quite a lot of support for that because uh, Václav Klaus is uh, standing up as someone who defends Czech national interests and believes that European Union is uh, uh, in the future and even now. Uh, focusing on dissolving the, the, the national integrities of, of all the countries in Europe. And I think that uh, and British conservatives are very much supported, are very much supportive of Václav Klaus, and they have even promised that if he can hold that signature for another three, four months, uh, the conservatives, when they get in power in Britain, they might support him and uh, vote against the, uh, the Lisbon Treaty. But I, so I think that the Czechs, have not seen so far, even though we are the members of the Czech uh, of the European Union for several years, we have not seen the impact positive enough so to, to, to embrace European Union. But I think that the argument, just as you suggested, is if we are members of the greater body, we are not as vulnerable as a small nation standing alone uh, next to Germany, next to Russia. Um, so. There is a political issue and there is like a nationalistic issue which in theory clash. So is there an economic side to fear that the, it's going to create economic pressures? Oh, well, I, I think that now... Uh, it has, it like some of the pressures in Italy and Portugal and places like that. Yeah, I, I think so. But you know, I think that in today's economic crisis, I mean, everybody's worried about economy in, 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 in many ways. And I think that uh, one of the things that we don't want to get into, into a deeper discussion about that is an economic transformation from socialism to some sort of capitalism uh, was in many ways painful and uh, many people, economists today, but you know, it's 20 years later, it's always easy to say that was wrong. Uh, they are looking at uh, the transformation as basically selling out the national property to foreign companies because almost every major company now in Czech Republic is, uh, is owned by foreign companies, by, 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 especially by German companies, French. Uh, so. We don't have that many of our national, really, industry. It is done, it, it is produced, things are produced in Czech Republic, but they're owned by foreign companies. And you know, you Americans know what it is like, you know, and you just need to defend and protect your, your own industry. Czechs don't have that much to protect anymore. That was one of the problems.